Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, if you watched my previous lecture that I posted on YouTube, uh, together with the lecture before that, where we, we met in person and talked about uh, big O notation. Um, and before that, we talked about algorithms for two lectures. These are all tied together um, and are a subfield of something called uh, complexity theory. And complexity theory is something, it's its own field inside of computer science and mathematics. And um, there's a very famous problem in complexity theory that I'd like to uh, show you a YouTube video kind of talking about it uh, first before we get started with today's lecture. Um, just as you're watching it, remember that with these algorithms, we typically have an input to them, right? And the input has a size to it, say n, right? And then the algorithm performs a number of steps. And during the, the course of this algorithm running, whatever algorithm you're considering, a certain amount of comparisons or operations will occur inside of it. So if your input size is n and you have an algorithm, you'll have a function that kind of measures how many comparisons or operations you do during the course of the algorithm. And this problem called p versus np is one of the, the like the biggest problems, open problems in computer science and mathematics. And um, this video in particular, uh, I think does a really good job of describing it at a very um, like, uh, like, like high level, um, not about like the, the, the gory details, but just like the general idea. Okay, so let's go ahead and watch. Today, I wanna to talk about the deepest unanswered question in computer science and maybe in all of math a problem called P versus NP. And I want to talk about how ideas from computing show up in the everyday world around us and how problems as seemingly disparate as protein folding and making up crossword puzzles share a common core difficulty that turns out to be a lot like Sudoku. Well, okay, basically it is Sudoku. In 2000, the Clay Institute offered $1 million each for the solutions to seven key problems in math, the Millennium Prize problems. These are profound and difficult problems, and for most of them, it takes a lot of specialized knowledge to even understand the question. Of the seven problems, P versus NP was both the most recently conceived in 1971 and by far the easiest one to understand and explain. And in March 2010, the Clay Institute awarded the first of its seven prizes for the solution to, yeah, not P versus NP. So what is the P versus NP question? Well, back in the 70s, computer scientists were busily figuring out how to program their retrofabulous cabinet-sized computers to solve all the world's problems. Sometimes the first program anyone could think of for a particular problem would be unworkably slow, but then over time, people would come up with clever ways to make it faster. Or at least that happened for some problems. For others, nobody was coming up with faster programs. To get a handle on the situation, they started sorting the problems into classes based on how fast a program could solve them. For problems like multiplication, they had really fast programs. And for others, like playing absolutely perfect chess, they figured out that there just was no fast program. But for a bunch in between, they weren't sure whether there was a fast way to do it. So they kept trying. This is where P and NP come in. Skipping a ton of details for a second, P is a class that basically includes all the problems that can be solved by a reasonably fast program, like multiplication or alphabetizing a list of names. And then around and including P, we sort of discovered a class called NP. That's all the problems where if you're given a correct solution, you can at least check it in a reasonable amount of time. NP was totally maddening because it contained lots of important problems like vehicle routing and scheduling and problems in circuit design and databases. And often we'd get lucky and find that an NP problem was actually a part of P and we'd have our fast program. But for a lot of them, that didn't seem to be happening. So people started to wonder whether everything in NP would turn out to be in P or if there were some NP problems that were truly harder than the ones in P. That's the P versus NP question. If all the NP problems are really in P, a lot of important puzzles we've been struggling with are going to turn out to be easy for computers to solve. Puzzles connected to biology and curing cancer, puzzles in business and economics, we'd have a lot of miracle answers almost overnight. And also the encryption we use for things like online banking would be easy to crack because it's based on NP problems. Okay, examples. I like to think of the problems in NP as being basically like puzzles, because I think what makes a puzzle a puzzle is that it's a problem where you can give away the answer. And that's what NP means. Like with Sudoku, Sudoku puzzles can take a long time to solve, but if I give you a solved Sudoku grid, checking it for mistakes is pretty quick. Outside of NP are problems where it's hard to even check an answer. Like, what's the best move to make in this chess game? I could tell you the answer, but how would you know whether I'm right? 
Well, you wouldn't, because finding out requires a calculation so enormous that there's a pretty good argument we'll never be able to build a computer that can do it. To me, that's not a very good puzzle. It's practically impossible to know whether you've solved it. On the other side are all the reasonable, solvable puzzles in P. These are clearly also in NP, because one way to check an answer is to go through the process of finding it yourself. Like if I were to tell you that the answer to 51 times 3 is 153, how would you check whether I'm right? You'd probably just multiply 51 by 3 yourself, because it's fast to do it. But Sudoku is different, or at least we think it is. It seems like solving a Sudoku grid is a lot harder than checking a solution, but in fact, nobody's been able to prove it yet. As far as we know, there could be a clever way of playing Sudoku much, much faster. So that's the question. Does being able to quickly recognize correct answers mean there's also a quick way to find them? Nobody knows for sure, but either way, figuring out exactly how this works would teach us something important about the nature of computation. It gets weirder from here, but first, three important details. One, you might be thinking, hey, Sudoku is tough and all, but it's not that hard. What's the big deal? Well, we're really talking about how the difficulty scales up as you make the problem bigger and bigger. Like, how much harder is a 100 by 100 Sudoku grid than a standard 9 by 9 grid? We've been making computers exponentially faster as time goes on, so for problems that don't get exponentially harder as they get bigger, all we have to do is wait for computers to get more powerful, and then even huge versions of those problems will be easy to solve by computer. Like, multiplication problems are pretty easy for computers even with enormous numbers. As the numbers get bigger, multiplying them just doesn't get harder very fast. These days, the phone in your pocket is what would have been referred to in the 1970s as a supercomputer, and you'd have to make a truly huge multiplication problem to stand up to all the computational power we've got now. Lots of familiar puzzles like mazes and Rubik's cubes are in the same camp. Hard for people, but easy work for computers. And then there's Sudoku. Computers can usually solve a normal 9x9 grid in a few milliseconds, even though humans find them challenging. But as you make the grid bigger, the problem just gets really hard, rapidly getting out of reach for even the most powerful computers. Two. P stands for polynomial time. In P, the number of steps you have to do to solve a problem, and therefore the amount of time that it takes, is some polynomial function of its size. Polynomial is a mishmash of Greek and Latin meaning many names, which is, regrettably, a pretty typical example of math's flair for unhelpful terminology. Anyway, polynomials are functions involving n or n squared or n to other powers, like these. But importantly, they're not exponential functions, like 2 to the power of n, which gets to be a ton of steps really fast as n goes up, a lot quicker than n to the power of 2. So that's P. It's problems like mazes and multiplication, where the number of steps required isn't that bad compared to the size of the problem. NP is all about polynomial time checking. NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time which, being math terminology, is an almost mean-spirited way of saying that if you had a bajillion computers and you could check all possible answers at the same time, you could find a correct solution in polynomial time. 2.5. We're actually talking about the number of steps required to solve a problem in the worst-case scenario. Like, how many steps does it take to unscramble a Rubik's Cube? Well, when it's scrambled like this, it takes one step, but it can get a lot worse. Similarly, some 9x9 Sudokus are harder than others. People also look at things like the best case and the average case, but worst case analysis is what we know the most about. Three, actually, pretty much everybody thinks it's obvious that NP contains more problems than P. It's just that we haven't been able to prove it. The bad news for fast solutions came in the early 70s when complexity researchers realized that dozens of those NP problems they were struggling with were essentially all the same problem, with some easy polynomial time complications thrown in here and there. These are called NP-complete problems, and since that first batch in the 70s, we've added Sudoku and protein folding and problems underlying puzzles and games like Battleship, Free Cell, Mastermind, Tetris, Minesweeper, and making up crossword puzzles. Even classic video games like Super Mario Brothers and Metroid turn out to be connected to NP-complete level traversal problems. NP-complete is yet another math phrase, meaning that these problems include all the really hard parts of every NP problem. A fast program for solving any NP-complete problem could be used to solve every problem in NP. The whole class would instantly collapse. So yeah, amazingly, Sudoku is hard because it involves literally the same NP-complete task that makes protein folding hard. If you come up with a profoundly faster way to play Sudoku, let somebody know, okay? Because fast protein folding would help us cure cancer. But the fact that a bunch of smart people have all been unsuccessful coming up with fast programs to solve what turned out to be essentially the same problem looks like a pretty good clue that the fast programs just aren't out there. So why has it been so hard to prove P versus NP one way or the other? Well, fun fact, proving things is an NP problem. The P versus NP question itself is one of these problems. So yeah, this might be difficult. Or not. We don't know. 
as the field of computational complexity has developed, we've discovered a lot of complexity. The P versus NP question turns out to be just the main attraction in a huge and complicated zoo of complexity classes. Beyond NP, there are even harder classes of problems like X, the class of problems including figuring out the best move in chess that takes exponential time to even check. This whole upper area of problems that are at least as hard as NP complete is called NP hard. There's also co NP, the class of problems where instead of being easy to check right answers, it's easy to exclude wrong answers, which may or may not be the same as NP. And then there's P space, the class of problems that can be solved given unlimited time, but using only a polynomial amount of space for memory. There are also problems that can be solved probabilistically in polynomial time. That class is called BPP, and it may or may not actually be the same as P. And then there's a quantum computing analog of BPP called BQP. All over the place in here are complicated little classes that would take a lot of explaining. And actually, some of these turn out to be infinite hierarchies of problems that are slightly more difficult from the ones beneath them. We know there's an exponential hierarchy, and there's probably a polynomial hierarchy. And out beyond all of this are problems that are just not solvable by any computer in any amount of time or space. To me, the amazing thing about this whole complexity zoo is that we're talking literally about what can be computed in a given amount of space and time. We're not just looking at the nature of computation here, we're looking at the nature of space and time themselves. This mess of computational complexity classes, I think, ultimately has implications for physics and biology and for our basic understanding of everything. As an example of those implications, here's how Scott Aronson, a complexity researcher at MIT, explained his intuition about P versus NP. If P were equal to NP, then the world would be a profoundly different place than we usually assume it to be. There would be no special value in creative leaps, no fundamental gap between solving a problem and recognizing the solution once it's found. Everyone who could appreciate a symphony would be Mozart. Everyone who could follow a step-by-step -step argument would be Gauss. The world around us, the nature of living things and ideas, of art and genius, is molded around the deep structure of computation. In a very real way, something connected to P versus NP shows up in the struggles of scientists and artists. Chopin once said, simplicity is the final achievement. After one has played a vast quantity of notes and more notes, it is simplicity that emerges as the crowning reward of art. And Jack Kerouac put it like this, one day I will find the right words and they will be simple. All right, let me pause the recording. Okay, so hopefully that YouTube video was moderately entertaining and that you kind of learned something new, like we saw some things and thought about problems in a new way. Because really, that's what it is. Algorithms are designed to solve problems, to calculate things, to solve problems. And it's interesting to me that, well, it was interesting to me, it still is, when I first found out about this notion of complexity, that some algorithms just some problems do not have efficient algorithms. Okay. So, but how do we measure like efficiency? And okay. um, well, this is this notion of algorithmic complexity. So there's two different, there's two types of complexity. So there are, so there's what's called time complexity. And then there's called space complexity. Okay. Now, uh, space complexity deals with like <clears throat> storage, memory, um, things like this. So, so like um, computer memory. And this is again in the context of an algorithm. And so, <clears throat> Space complexity is not, we're not going to talk about that in this course at all. Uh, you will probably see something about space complexity in a course like data structures or something like that. Um, we're going to talk about time complexity. And this is um, just another way of saying um, to measure um, simple operations in algorithm. So measure simple operations used by an algorithm. And this is 
how we measure time complexity. So simple operations like Boolean comparisons, additions, multiplications, divisions, subtractions, assignment. These are simple operations. I think your Zybook refers to them as atomic operations. And this is how we measure complexity of algorithms. Now it's kind of, it might be kind of confusing because it says time and like there's no time there. It's just the wording that we chose. Um, and the reason why we're, we're doing it this way is because it's kind of like, it doesn't matter what machine you're using, right? Like I could run something on this computer that would run faster than on that computer, right? But the number of operations remains the same, right? And if that number of operations grows fast enough with the input size, then at some point, it doesn't matter how fast your computer is, right? Like if an algorithm is taking, is going to take more operations than there are like seconds that have been since the universe began, then we have no hope of ever like solving that problem, right? So that's why we measure in terms of operations. It's like agnostic of the machine you're using. It's just a different way of measuring. So maybe we can consider an algorithm, a very basic algorithm, and look at its time complexity. And throughout this discussion, I'm going to assume worst case performance. And so looking at worst case performance is what I would say most people would assume you're, you're talking about when you say time complexity. But there are also like average case performance. So the algorithm that we're going to consider first is the linear search algorithm. I think that's the easiest one to start with. Search. So as inputs, if you recall, we have x as an integer. And then we have a sequence of distinct integers. A1, A2, dot dot dot, A n. These are distinct integers. All right, and we're just searching for the location of X inside that list. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and write out the algorithm now. All right, part one, assign the variable I equals to one. So while I is less than or equal to N and X is not equal to A sub I, yeah. by three, we just increment I by one. And then part four. So if I is less than or equal to N, then we set the location variable equal to I. Else location we set to be an index not found in there, like zero. Just indicating that it's not in the list. And then finally, we, we uh, return location. The location variable. Okay. So we can give a big O estimate on the complexity of this algorithm in terms of a number of different things, like addition, maybe how many additions we do. Um, I think in this context, maybe we would be asked, Boolean comparisons is like our, our operation that we're concerned with. So like the problem statements, so 
give a um, big O um, complexity estimate for linear search. in terms of Boolean operations or Boolean comparisons. Okay. So what I like to do when doing this even in my like own like research work sometimes, is I'll have the pseudocode written out and then I'll use a different color pen and just carefully go through the thing and start counting. So um, complexity theory, um, measuring complexity of algorithms is, is closely related to a field in mathematics called combinatorics, the study of combinations and counting. So, and you would think like counting combinatorics might be like a, easy field of mathematics, complete opposite. Counting things is very difficult. You have to be very careful if you're going to be accurate. Question. So it's, it's been bothering me since the day we started the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So why do you do the double dot? Oh, why do I do that? Double? It's just, it's like a way of saying assignment. Oh, oh, so, so it's not one of them. Yeah, it's just like this is now being assigned with the double dots there. It's being assigned to now I plus one. That's all it's saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. that bring that up. All right. So, all right. Okay. So, let's figure this out. Right? And we have to like work our way through it slowly. So, here, this is an assignment, right? And we're assuming that n is like greater than or equal to one, right? So, we know that this is going to happen at least once. Like, um, and oh, what if we find it at the very first step? Like, what if x is equal to a1? Then we like break down a while loop, whatever. But again, we're doing worst case analysis. Right? What's the worst possible case for this algorithm? Well, if I'm just looking at it, this while loop's going to run all the way through, which would mean that it's not in there, right? So we're going to assume that that integer is not in that list. Under that assumption, that's the worst possible case that this algorithm would perform. Right? If it was in that list, it would exit out somewhere before i is equal to n. Otherwise, it's going to go all the way through. Right? So that's worst case analysis. So under that assumption, um, how many times are we going to check this value? If, the, if x is not in that list, how many times are we going to check? Like, look at that. And that, actually. Hmm? Right. If i is in there, right, um, we're checking this at least n times, right? So this, like right here, will happen n times, right? At least. And then this is also going to happen n times, right? We're going to, we have to check that and we have to check that. So n times. Oh, but then what happens here? When i is equal to n, we, we go in here again, and then we increment i, and then we have to check that one more time. So really, this is like n plus one time. <laughs> right, that we're checking, we're doing that Boolean comparison. And then that'll, that'll break us out before we get there. Right? So that'll break, done. So n times and plus one times of checking this while loop. Okay. So then um, we have to check that. So this is like plus one right there. And then that would fail, and then we assign location, and then we're out. So it looks like this is how many times 
we've got it. So it's like, it's like what? Um, so if our function is f of n, right? n is the size of the, the list we pass in. It's going to be equal to n plus one for that one, right? Um, plus n for that, right? Plus one for that one. Like that. So this will be all together 2n plus 2. Yes. So the loops do will tell you things, right? And that's that's kind of um, why I wanted to start with this one. So this while loop, in the worst case, we have to check it every single time. And there's a comparison there. And so if we go through all of it and we're careful, we'll see that there's that many comparisons for that and that for that. And it's all because of that while loop. Okay, so if it's two, if there's two loops, Two nested loops, then you'd have to account for that. And we'll see that in a second. So like, yeah, if I, if I, I think, so like if you have like two while loops, like if you have this while loop and then another exact while loop, the same thing, then it'd be like in like, like that squared <laughs> number of times. But for this, it's simple. There's only that one while loop. This is our complexity function. It's two and plus two, right? And if we recall, so, so the solution here would look something like um, the so um, f of n is equal to two n plus two is the number of Boolean comparisons. Which we know um, is big O of n, right? This is a polynomial of degree one. Polynomials of degree one are big O of n, yeah. So, so hence um, linear search. As time complexity big O of n. But actually, we can say more, um, right? The, the question asks for a big O estimate. But if you watched that YouTube video that I posted last week from my previous semester, you know that um, polynomials, um, like if you have a polynomial of degree k, then that has order. Uh, X to the power K, big, um, big theta X to the power N. So it's like order X to the power K. But since the question I wrote is big O, so we we'll say has time complexity um, big O. Okay, so, so now, so what is this telling us, right? Like, this is like a relatively simple function, but sometimes you can have like really nasty looking functions that measure the, the, the number of operations in an algorithm. The big O here is telling me that it's no worse than like a limit, like just n, right? It's a constant multiple of n, but whatever. It's, just, it's the same thing, right? So that means that this algorithm is like fine, whatever. It's, it's linear <laughs> in its growth, right? What would be bad is if the algorithm was like something like um, big omega of like, or big theta of like two to the power. If you had something like that, then it's terrible, right? Like think about like this, the size of lists that you might encounter in a programming assignment. Like you might have a list that's like a, like a thousand long, right? So this search will take roughly like a thousand operations. But if for whatever reason, if it was like orders, so that's big data from the lecture on YouTube that I have, um, that, right, then, Two to the power of thousand is like ridiculous, and that's a thousand as a small list. You can have lists of like a million entries. Two to the power of a million is that you're not going to do anything, 
the algorithm will never converge. So, all right, let's just do another one. All right, so maybe uh, we can do one with some nested nested loops. So, yeah, let's look at like bubble sort. Get one some nested loops in there. It's an input, just a list of real numbers. A through A N. Um, so it's just reals with N greater than equal to two. Okay. This one, there's only three lines. Okay, so we have four i equals one to n minus one or j equals one to n minus i if a j is greater than a j plus one then interchange a j and a j plus one. And that's it. <clears throat> All right, so let's switch this from linear search to bubble search. Do the same thing, we have Boolean comparisons. Yes? Is there a reason why you're looking at Boolean comparisons? Just because that's the, like, that's really all that we'll, we'll need in this case. In a lot of, a lot of times, I think that like this, like, if we were to like also look at like additions or something, right, with the Boolean comparisons, all it's gonna do is like add like a multiple of two to the count that we get. And we'll have like a different coefficient of the variable n, but the coefficients don't matter. Like if you think back to like the big O estimates, like the coefficients don't matter when you look at like, like just now, big O of like two n plus two, I mean like the, like a big O estimate of that is just big O of n, that two in front of it won't matter. It's really the power that matters, right? So like doing like additions, and Boolean checks and things like that together, in the end won't matter, right? It's not like the, the those, those and at least like in these algorithms we're looking at, that's not gonna add a square term anywhere. It's just gonna add like a, a uh, it's gonna increment the coefficient of n. And we wanna know what like the, the lead, like the highest power of n is. That's what we're really concerned about. So a lot of times, like when I'm looking at algorithms, I'll just get like a quick guess in my head about roughly what it is. Like this, just looking at this, this is at most, um, like this is like order, like it's like at most like big O n squared or something, right? Or n minus one squared, right? Like just like overestimate, right? If I check this n minus one times and this n minus one times, it's like, n minus one n squared, that's like a worst case. It's gonna be a little bit better than that, but like I'll just look at it and say, okay, get an idea. In which if it's n minus one squared, that's big O of n. I mean big O of n squared. Same thing. Now your side book will probably like have you count like all of them, but it's it's the same thing. Like if you do that and then also do just like the Boolean comparisons or like the basic simple operation, just pick one, right? 
where they're obviously happening. I think sometimes there won't be building comparisons, but like just pick one and just compare it to what you got by doing all of them. It'll be like the same order, right? roughly. But it does depend on the algorithm. Right? Sometimes you have to be very careful. With these, it's not going to matter at all. Okay. So, Boolean comparisons, meaning like, okay, we have an assignment here, right? And then this one has to go, it has to go, I has to go from one to n minus one. So we have to check whether or not I equals n minus one at each of those steps, right? We have to check. Is I equal n minus one? 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 So that's like, like n minus one for all of this business here. Like we know at least that's gonna be at least that many, right? So then here, when so now this is get, going to get tricky. Like if we're gonna be very careful with our counting. So maybe in this case, we should slow our roll and just kind of like look at one instance at a time. Right? So like i is equal to one, all right? What do we do? I is equal to one. Okay. So then we have J is equal from one to N minus one, right? So okay. and then inside that for loop we have a Boolean check. Right? So it's like here this is gonna happen plus one time. So like plus one there inside of there. So when j is equal to one, add one. And then we check if j is equal to n minus one. So it's like plus one for each of those j's. And then plus one inside of there, right? So it's like two ones for each j, right? Do you see that two ones for each j? You're checking if j is equal to n minus one, and then you're checking this condition here. So, it's, so for each, so it's like, so it's like here, I can give it a that, give it a that. So this is like all together. This is um, two times n minus one checks. So that's when i is equal to one, right? <laughs> and then um, we have i is equal to two, right? And by the way, there's like a plus one for this i up here, right? There's i equal n minus one. It's like a plus one, right? So maybe for this like block here, it's two n minus one for here, and then the plus one right there. You can see how this is not so easy keeping track of everything already. <laughs> right? All right, so for i is equal to two, we're gonna have j equals one to n minus two, right? And then we have like one check in there, one check in there, one check in there, one check in there, right? So it's like what? Two times n minus two plus one. You see the pattern now? So that would be uh, the plus one comes from checking that, and the two n minus two is for here, and that guy right there. <laughs> you see that? So then it's like this guy here plus this guy here, plus dot, 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 plus two times n minus, what's the, the very last i? It's n minus one, right? So it's like i is equal to one, i is equal to two, dot, 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 i is equal to n minus one. Because that's where we're going to. That's the very last guy, right? So like this function here is the number of Boolean comparisons we're going to get. You see that? So this is one way to measure it. I just thought it'd be easier to focus in on one i at a time. <laughs> because we kind of know how to do just one loop, right? So we just focus on an i, that one loop, we have that. 
kind of looks like the while loop we just did, right? If I focus in there, we have another one there. But we have to sum all of these because these are all going to occur, okay? So how many ones do we have, by the way? N minus one of them, right? One, two, one, two, all the way to that index, n minus one. So it looks like the function that we're going to get looks like this. So f of n is equal to like there's it's like a lot of n, like there's going to be like all those ones, like that one, that one, that one, all of those together, there'll be n minus one of them, right? So it's like n minus one plus these terms, right? So what is that? That's, I'm going to introduce summation notation. The sum from i is equal one to n minus one of two to the power, I mean, two times n, I'll use brackets here to kind of differentiate, n minus i, yeah, it's just i actually. Like this is my i, 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 i. I don't need the brackets there. Yeah, just this. And this notation, does this, do you know what this notation means? This, the sigma. Yeah, it's from I, summing this from I is equal to one to N minus one. Yeah. It's a shorthand for like getting rid of this long distance here. Okay, but do you see that like, this here came from all those ones being added. There's n minus one of them. And then this is just two times n minus i, two times n minus i all the way through. So, what's up? Yeah, so the n minus one part, like that, is just like that plus that plus that, plus that, all those ones. And there's n minus one of them. Okay, so we're almost at something. Uh, I don't know what this, we need a formula. This is kind of a formula, but it's not there yet. So let's see if we can write a formula for that. So I'm just gonna rewrite the function. Okay. So notice that like there was a two multiplying each of those things, right? Two times n minus one, two times n minus two, two. So I can just factor that two out, right? It's multiplying all of them. So I can write this as like, like plus two times n minus i, like that. I just factored out the two from each of those terms in the sum. Does that make sense? Okay. So then I have to tell you something about this guy. Um, we haven't talked about this yet. Um, but there are closed form equations for sums that exist sometimes that you can prove with a technique called mathematical induction, which we'll probably talk about next time, since I'm gonna state something that's true, and I don't like stating it without proving it. So I'll probably just prove it next time and show you how to prove these things. But like, I need more room. Um, so just, there is a formula. One plus two plus dot 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 plus N is equal to N times 
n plus one is over two. This is true. Did n plus one or n minus one? Hold on. So when n is three, so one plus two plus three, that's equal to six, right? So three times four, three times four is 12, divided by two is six. Yeah, it is plus two. If it was a minus one there, then it'd be three times two to be here. So, so that's a formula. And we'll prove that next time with mathematical induction. Look at what that is. This is very similar. What is that sum? So that sum is equal to n minus one plus n minus two plus dot 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 plus two plus one, right? So it's like the sum up to n minus one, right? So if we do like one plus two plus dot 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 plus n minus one, right? We can just plug into this formula. Like replace n by that thing. So it's going to be what? It's going to be n minus 1. All right, so that's like that, right? Times n minus 1 plus 1. n. All over 2. That's all right. If I just replace n by n minus 1 there, there, and then all divided by 2. So this formula becomes n minus one plus two times that thing, which is just n times n minus one over two. Notice the twos divide out. And we'll have, so two divided by two, just one goes away. So then we'll have n minus, I'll just write it out. I was going to take a step ahead. I'm running out of room. How many n minus one terms do you have? n plus one of them. Just collect like terms. Or if you want, factor out n minus one. You have, so if this is equal to, um, what is it? n minus one times n plus one. Or just distribute in. You know, like maybe it'd be easier to distribute in actually. So like n times so of n squared, n times n there, n so minus n plus n, those go away. n squared minus one. So the big O estimates for this for bubble sort. So bubble sort is big O of n squared. It's actually order n squared. It's big big theta n squared. So realistically, instead of giving a, a big O estimate, you say that bubble sort is order n squared. So if like you have an input list of size like a thousand, the number of simple operations is like roughly, you know, a thousand squared for bubble sort, which isn't the best you can do by any means, right? Um, but hopefully like gives you an idea that like, okay, and what did I guess earlier, right? Like I guessed like, n minus one times n minus one, two of that maybe, right? It was like basically, I said it was basically n squared, right? But I overestimated a lot. Like I wouldn't have got like this precise formula, right? I wouldn't have got n squared minus one. But I would have gotten something close to it. I just like overestimating a little bit. Yeah. So um, that's actually something useful. Like, uh, it's it's like it's really hard sometimes for students to get used to this this notion that in practice you don't really like you don't 
calculate equals that much. <laughs> the equals are not like as important as you might think. Estimates are more important. Or like even like that is an estimate on that. Right? But you can do an estimate on this estimate to get like a general sense of how many operations are going to be needed in like a worst case scenario. Okay. So I guess that will be it for today's lecture. And I'll stop the recording there.